this morning. Sin is the problem. The good news is that Jesus is the solution to that problem. What we did last week is we took a moment and we examined the Passover as it relates to the history of the Israel nation and in the New Testament how it relates to Christ and his sacrifice for us. We want to continue kind of examining the cross of Christ roundabout for the next several weeks. Today I want to do that by looking at sin. We need to have some conviction of sin. We need to understand that we have sin and that we need the problem, or we have the problem of sin, that we need the solution that Christ and his cross offers for us. That's what we need, and hopefully we can have that this morning as we begin to look at what it means to have some conviction of sin. I want to start by defining terms. That word conviction can be used a couple of different ways. And we want to see if we can figure out exactly how it's used this morning. Conviction of sin that can be defined two different ways. Definition one means a fixed or a firm belief. You can be or you can have conviction. I believe wholeheartedly that this is the case. And you stand upon your conviction. In a legal sense, it can also mean a declaration of guilt. This word conviction comes from two different words. To be convinced, which is where we get definition one. Or to be convicted, which is where we get definition two. To, be con- to have, rather, conviction is to have a belief or a, a firm idea fixed in our mind that such, in, such a thing is the case, or it is a declaration of guilt. Conviction of both best definitions of conviction apply to sin. Because what is sin? Sin is a transgression of God's law. 1 John 3 and verse 4 that was just read for us a moment ago. That is what sin is. It is a transgression of God's law. So we understand that we can be convicted of violating God's law. Let's look at some examples of sin uh, as it is mentioned in the Bible. Uh, We first want to turn over to 1 Corinthians 6. Uh, Now this is not all sin now, mind you. Uh, But here are just a few passages where some sins are listed. 1 Corinthians 6, we want to begin in verse 9. Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Those are specific sins that Paul mentions. We understand, he says in verse 11, that there is a solution to those sins. Sanctified, justified, washed in the name of the Lord Jesus. But we want to go over now to Galatians chapter 5 and read another list of sins. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19, Paul talks about the work of the flesh, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murderers, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Did you notice the end there? And such like. Doesn't mean that these are the only sins that we can commit, but if it's anything like this, it's also a sin. If it is different than what God's law has stated, it is sin. Now, as we look at this, the definition of sin is the transgression of God's law. And that this word conviction means we need to be convinced or we are going to be convicted. Let's take a moment and examine those thoughts for just a second. 
Let's talk about what it means to be convinced we have sin. Last week as we started intro on this idea of looking at the cross of Christ from kind of different angles. We talked about how one of the greatest problems in the world is that we don't love God the way we need to. We don't respect Christ and his sacrifice the way we need to. Part of that is because we don't understand his sacrifice. We don't understand the cross. Some of that is the fact that we don't really understand sin and we don't really want to realize that we have it. If I don't have sin, then it's not that big a deal. Or if I'm not as big a sinner as somebody else is, then it's, it's not that big a deal. All sin is a big deal. James tells us if we keep the whole law yet offend in one point, we're guilty of the whole law. We will be convicted. We talked this morning about different kinds of sins. We talk about sins that we commit. Well, and those are the sins that Paul was just mentioning. Adultery and fornication and murder and all. These are things that we do that are bad. We also have sins of omission. Things that we ought to do, that we're commanded to do, that we don't. Evangelism is one of those things. If we don't evangelize, then we're sinning. But do we think about it that way? That's why we want to talk this morning. We need to be convinced that we have sin. And we'll kind of define that a little further as we go. Sin is common to all men. Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We understand that. 1 John, I want to look at verses 1 and 8, or 1 John 1, let's look at verses 8 and 10, and in a moment we'll come back and look at the whole thing in context. 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. When we think about whether or not we have sin, and we're trying to understand where we are at in relation to God, Paul says this in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul, the greatest of evangelists, an apostle of Christ, says, I am the chief of all sinners. What did Paul mean? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If we say that we have no sin, then we'd receive ourselves. The truth is not this. If we say that we have not sinned, we're not in God, basically. And Paul says, I am the chief of all sinners. We need to understand that if we have not come to Christ through obedience unto him, saved by grace through faith, through our obedience unto the New Testament, then we are in sin. We are indeed sinners. Paul says in Colossians 3, that you were living in sin, engaged in it daily. We need to understand that if we have never become a Christian, if we've never put on Christ, that we have sin. That sin is a transgression of God's law. If we can't be convinced of the fact that we are guilty, we're going to be found guilty anyway. We need to understand the seriousness of the charge or charges that are laid at our feet by God. You've done this. You've done that. What is entailed on our spiritual rap sheet? If God were the police, what sort of file would he have on us? We are guilty of those things. That is sin. You don't want to show up in court one day and wonder why you're there. I I don't know why I'm here. When the police officer pulls you over, you know why I pulled you over? I would imagine nine times out of ten, you know exactly why those blue lights were behind your car. You knew that you didn't really stop at that stop sign, or you knew you were going a little too fast. When we're going to be convicted of something, we need to understand that it's something that we did. We need to be convinced that we have sin. And we need to understand that sin is critical to all souls. When I say critical, I mean like critical condition. Whether or not our soul has sin attached to it in the eyes of God is critical to determining our eternal destination. 
Ezekiel 18 and verse 20 says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. The son does not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. The soul that sins, that's the soul that dies. The soul that has sin is going to perish because of that sin. I don't have your sin. You do not have my sin. You will answer for what you do. That sin will separate you from God. Look at Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. The soul that sins, it will die. Why? Because those sins separate us from God. Jesus says, I tell you, nay, but unless ye repent, you'll likewise perish. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you will likewise perish. You will die in your sins. Unless you repent of those things that are sinful. Think about it. Being convinced that we have sin is the first step toward receiving salvation, when you talk about uh, addiction, when you talk about different programs, one of the first steps in any program to get rid of addiction or anything else that we have is admitting there's a problem. Do you love God the way you should? Do you respect Christ and his sacrifice the way you should? Do you understand what sin is and what it does to your soul? If you don't, then you won't. Growing up, our parents made sacrifices for us. We didn't understand it then. As parents, we understand it now. God made sacrifices for us. Christ gave the ultimate sacrifice for us. Because we have sin. Without sin, none of that would have been necessary at all. Without sin in the world, Christ would not have had to come. The church would not have had to be established. We could be living in the garden in the utopia that God created for man without sin. We need to understand that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God if we've never come to Christ. Then we still have all this on us. We need to understand that as Christians we don't have to sin, but we still will from time to time. The more we mature, the less we should sin. But as we become Christians, as we get into Christ, as we start to live faithfully, for whatever reason, we begin to compare ourselves with other folks. Well, you know what? I, I'm not engaged in all this stuff. I'm fine. Well, who cares what everybody else is doing? What are you doing? I don't care what your neighbors do. I don't care what your co-workers or your friends do. What are you doing? Is it sinful? If so, it is critical to your soul. It will kill you eternally. You need to take a look at your life this morning. I'm asking you to. What in your life that are you are doing that is sinful? What are you doing? What are you not doing in your life that is sinful? This morning, we need to be convinced that sin is real, that sin can happen to us, and that sin will drag us down. We need to be convinced we have sin. We need to be convinced that sin is real. We need to be convinced that any sin, no matter how small, will keep us out of heaven. The fact so many times is we, well, we know what sin is and we know what sin does. We're just not convinced that it applies to us. Oh, that, that's for somebody else. That, it is for you. The gospel is for all. It's for everybody. It applies to me and it applies to you this morning. We need to be convinced that whatever we do that transgresses or breaks God's law, no matter how small, no matter how it compares to anybody else, will keep us out of heaven. We need to be convinced that we have sin and we need to be convinced what sin does this morning. But we also need to be convinced that we can have forgiveness. I'm not going to give you a problem this morning without giving you a solution. 
I know there is a difference between a saint and a sinner. I know that as Christians, we should no longer live in sin. But I know sometimes we're going to trip and fall and stumble and we're not going to do right and those things will happen. Theoretically, they happen less and less as we mature and grow in Christ. But when they do happen, we need to be convinced that they're ours and they're our responsibility to take care of and they're going to keep us from heaven if we don't. But along those same lines, on the other side of the coin, we need to be convinced that we have forgiveness. Forgiveness is certain and it is complete. Look at 1 John 5 and verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Let's go back and look at the middle. That ye may guess, hope, maybe, sort, no, that ye may know that you have eternal life. These things, the New Testament, is written so that we can know we have eternal life. There is no guesswork. Just like I can know if I have sin in my life, I can know that I have gotten sin out of my life through Christ and his sacrifice for me. How can I know that I have eternal life? Because God is not slack. 2 Peter 3, 9, concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not slack concerning his promises. God has promised it, that he will wash away all sin, that he will completely remove it. God has promised that. That's why I know that I can have eternal life. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. The sin which so easily besets, attacks, hinders us. How easy the Hebrews writer says that happens. Lay it aside. Let us run with patience the race that is set for us. How do we do that? Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Colossians chapter 3 says we need to set our sights on things that are above. Paul says in Philippians 4 that we need to think on pure, holy, just, honorable things. Forgiveness is certain. If we look to Christ, if we lay aside sin, because God has promised it and I can know that I have it. Just like I can look at the Bible and I can see what God has said is sinful. And I can see what God has commanded and I can do the things that are righteous or I can do the things that are wicked. I know if I have sin. I also know that I can get rid of sin. It is certain. And I want to talk about how complete it is for just a moment. Look at 1 John we notice verses 8 and 10 a while ago. Let's look at the whole thing now. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us, continually makes us clean from all sin. How? If we walk in the light. Now, some would say that we have no sin. John says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. What are you saying, John? John's saying God knows who you are, he knows where you are, and he knows where you're at spiritually. If you say that you have no sin, you're a liar, you can't go to heaven. If you say that you've never sinned, you're a liar, you can't go to heaven. If you will just admit and be convinced of the fact that there is sin and it needs to be taken care of. And if you come and you walk in the light and you stay in the light. You don't go back out in the darkness, but if you stay in the light, God will keep you cleansed of those sins. Confessing them. He will forgive them. Todd Clifford was here a few weeks ago and he filled in in class. And he said something that... I had thought about it before, but I hadn't thought of it in that way. 
No sinner outside of of Christ is ever told to confess their sins for salvation. No person who has ever been baptized into Christ has ever been told to be baptized again for the remission of sins. Sinners are told to be baptized into Christ to get rid of sins. Christians who have been baptized are told to confess their sins, to have them forgiven. If we're in Christ, we confess our sins to God, we acknowledge, we say, God, I have sinned. I want to get rid of it. We repent of those things, and we're forgiven them. 1 John 1, 7 through 10 shows us that we have sinned. But it also shows us how we get rid of it. We stay in the light and God cleanses us from those things. What do we have when we walk in the light that allows us to avoid sin, to have complete forgiveness? Thinking about that word complete. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, According as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of of him that has called us by glory and virtue. We have everything. We have completeness as it pertains to life and to godliness. Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all or complete spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What does that mean? I have complete forgiveness if I enter into and stay in the line. I have everything that pertains to life, everything that pertains to godliness, and all spiritual blessings and heavenly places in Christ. Sin is a horrible, horrible thing, but the cross of Christ, his sacrifice, gives us forgiveness just the way we need to be convinced of what sin does and how it will actually affect us. We also need to understand that forgiveness is complete if we will just take it. We talk about being convinced. Being convinced that we have forgiveness is what allows us to obtain and maintain our salvation. Mark chapter 16. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, whoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Whoever believeth not shall be condemned. If you believe, if you are convinced that you have sinned, and you are convinced that Christ is the answer for that, you will be baptized to wash those things away. You will stay in the light to keep those things from being added into your account. Whoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. If you're not convinced that you have sin, you don't care about Christ or his sacrifice. If you're not convinced that Christ is the answer for the sin that you have, you won't be baptized into Christ. Conviction. Fixed, firm belief in Sin and its ability to keep us from heaven and Christ and his sacrifice that can overcome that and get us into that home with Father for all of eternity, being convinced we have forgiveness as it allows us to obtain and maintain our salvation. If we're not convinced that we have sin, if we're not convinced that we have forgiveness of sin, then one of these days we're going to be convicted of our sin. Look at it for just a moment. Convicted, if we are convinced of no sin, we go back to 1 John 1 and verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, you know, there are some folks in this world who are absolutely convinced that they are fine and dandy the way that they are. Look at Ananias and Sapphira. But a certain man, Acts chapter 5, named Ananias, with Sapphira's wife, sold a possession. They kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Didn't have a problem in the world with misrepresentation. Oh, we're fine. It'll be fine. Nothing bad's going to happen. How did that turn out for Ananias and Sapphira, who dropped dead when confronted? Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Poor Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. Priests. Sons of the high priest. They knew exactly what they needed to do and how they needed to do it. They took either one of them their censer, and they put fire therein, and incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. They thought they were, oh, God won't mind, it'll be fine. Convinced they were okay. 
And there went out a fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. How did it work out for Nadab and Abihu, thinking they were fine? Some other folks who thought they were fine. In Exodus 32, when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, they gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what became of him. He went up to the mountain. And the more I study the book of Exodus, the more I just scratched my head and said, how can anybody be that stupid? You saw all the nine plagues that God did to Egypt, some of which they were spared from. You saw what the Passover did when it killed all the firstborn in the households of the Egyptians. You walked through on dry ground in the midst of the Red Sea. You saw God give you food out of nothing. They looked at the ground. They said, what is it? It's manna. You know what it means? What is it? After all of this, Moses says, I'm going up to get the law from God. Y'all, y'all hold on a little while. Don't come near the mountain. Now, granted, he's up there for a while, but they lose faith. And they said, you know what? Moses is gone. This will be fine. I just scratched my head. How can you be so dumb, Israel? And Aaron said unto them, stop it. Moses will be back. Let's keep the law. No, he says, all right, here what you do. Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons, your daughters. Bring them unto me. And they broke off all the gold. And they brought it to Aaron. Aaron, who will be the high priest. Now think about that. He received them and fashioned with it and graving tools. He made a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And Aaron saw it. He built an altar. And he made a proclamation. Tomorrow is the feast to this new God. Uh, excuse me? They thought they were just fine. They were convinced. This wasn't sinful. This will be fine. We need gods. Moses and his God have left. They didn't forgot that it was their God and had been for 400 years. How did it work out for them? Not too well at all. God and Moses were both sorely displeased. If we are convinced we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. We will not go to heaven. If we are not convicted of the fact that we have sin, well, you know, I've got sin. I'm just, I'm just, I don't have a whole lot of conviction about it. I'm just going to go through my life acting like it's okay. I know I'm doing wrong, but it, it'll be all right. Paul said to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be refilled from heaven with his mighty angels. Well, okay. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These folks who do not know God and who do not obey God. Shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And from the glory of his power, don't coast through life. Not knowing God, not obeying the gospel will not get you out of hell. Only Christ and his Passover sacrifice for us will do that. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many gospel you're not doing the things that I told you to do a lot of folks are just going through the motions every day is the same Matthew 24 but as the days of Noah were so shall the coming of the son of man be for as in the days were before the flood they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until that day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away just as so that shall be the coming of man People run around every day knowing that what they're doing is wrong, but they just don't care. You know, Moses or Noah's been preaching about getting on this ark for 120. I'm, I'm done with it. I don't care. It'll be fine. 
They were just fine until God shut the door of that ark and the rains came and they were all taken away. We need to understand this morning that godly sorrow, not worldly sorrow, godly sorrow convinces and convicts in order to avoid eternal conviction. We need to understand that sin will keep us out of heaven this morning and that Satan is doing everything he can to keep us sinning. If you've never put on Christ, then you don't have that hope of heaven. If you've put on Christ and wandered back out into the world, you can lose your eternal salvation. God will convict you no matter how small. Well, God won't do that. Well, yes, he will, actually. Colossians chapter 3 talks about sins that needed to be avoided. Mortifying these things. Otherwise, the wrath of God will descend upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God is not something that's mentioned often in the worldly Christianity, but something that's very biblical and very New Testament. Well, God, God won't keep me out of heaven if I didn't evangelize, or God won't keep me out of heaven if I laid out a worship, or God won't keep me out of heaven if I didn't give as I've been prospered. Yes, yes, he will. But remember, I'm not going to give you a problem without the solution. Remember that Christ is the solution to all of that. Walking in the light as he is in the light is the solution that gets you out of hell. And into heaven. That's what the cross of Christ does. It should convict us of our sin. Showing us the great need that we have. Think about all the little things we do that could keep us out of heaven. Well, who can do that? The disciples in Matthew 19 said, but Lord, this is a hard saying. It is. But we could do it and triumph all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Conviction of sin this morning. Do you have sin in your life? If you've never put on Christ and you still have all the sin that you've ever committed. Do you still have sin in your life? Have you come to Christ and has it been washed away? And have you wandered away? Have you went out into darkness? Are you not walking in the light as you need to? Are you starting adding to that rap sheet again? That file the police have on you? Is it growing? Spiritually speaking. Have you convinced yourself that it's not sinful? Or have you convinced yourself that it's going to be okay? Because it's not. Only Jesus and his cross can convince and convict you of your sins. Without understanding Christ and what he did for you. Enduring all that horrible shame on that cross was because you had sinned. Because I had sinned. Because he never had sinned. When that really starts to sink in. That'll motivate you. That'll move you. It's not because of anything I say. It's because it's what Christ did for me. It's what Christ did for you. It's understanding that we do things sometimes that are contrary to God's law. But understanding also that God has made a way of salvation and forgiveness. The question as we look at conviction this morning. Are you convinced of the fact that you need Christ because of sin in your life? Do you have enough conviction to make those things right this morning? If not, then God will convict you for all of eternity because of it. Something to think about as we stand and as we sing.